Our next presenter, Patrick Schoen, is a creative developer and tech lead based in Toronto, Canada, specializing in web decentralization, bots, data viz, and juggling things. Um, it says like juggling balls. I want to know if there's like like bowling pins, um, hacky sacks, chainsaws, torches, anything else interesting? Um, you use that intro, eh? Uh, I can actually juggle. So if we ever do this again in person, I can juggle on stage. Fun fact oh, for another oh, time. This has been recorded, just so everybody knows. Like, w this will come back to haunt you. I want you to know that. Oh, I'm fine Here with that. Go. We can do All it. Right, cool. No chainsaws, All right. just balls. <laughs> That's they. They might. They might have trouble with the insurance rider on that, even in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you for for coming along. We're really excited to see what you've got to show. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing all about it. And somebody, I need to know more about the alien kitty aspect of this, but I'm going to let you take it away. Sure. Um, I'll caveat this, that this was originally a two hour presentation and I've whittled it down to 30 minutes. So I think I'm good. <laughs> but if, if there's some room for Q and A at the end, you can ask me about the cat thing. So I'm Patrick, as I've already been introduced, I'll give like a short introduction about myself and the reason why I'm creating yet another framework. You can roll your eyes, another yet another JavaScript framework. Uh, but there's a reason for it. And it's also different than all these other JavaScript frameworks. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, it's more of a design pattern. Uh, but before we get there, let's talk about kind of where I'm coming from. I'm an older developer. So I've been developing websites since the very beginning of the web. Uh, and that's about 1993 or so. Uh, the first browser that I used back then was the NCSA Mosaic web browser. And things were very different back then. There wasn't a lot of graphics on websites. It was pretty much just like a glorified Word document. And people were pretty excited about it at the time. You had the ability to have like a Word document with images and format text, but then you could also have hyperlinks and link to other pages. So that was a really big deal at the time. But it really seemed more like it was for academia and at school, which is where I started using it as well. But then very quickly after that, people started realizing that you could cut up images uh, in Photoshop, which is primarily what I was using then, and then do a lot more graphically rich websites. And then things really started to get interesting about 1994, 1995. And that's when I've been professionally building websites since. So it's been a, a very long time and I've been through all the kind of like web development phases. I have a little bit of developer fatigue after all these years too. And uh, here I am, you know, proposing yet another kind of like JavaScript framework, but we're gonna talk about that. Um, I also have a little bit more of a creative background. So I am a second generation programmer. My mom was a programmer in COBOL and Fortran. And I was already surrounded by like computers and programming languages, but I was always more of a creative person and started actually as an art director. But at that time, you know, a webmaster kind of had to do everything. Like you had to be the designer that would design the site and then there was no one to build it. So you had to build it yourself. And then you needed to find a place to host it. And I kind of was doing all those different things, a bit of a jack of all trades. I love the programming part of it as well. Uh, and then because of the hosting bit, I also got into hosting and setting up servers, building my own servers and moving them, uh, moving them to co-location facilities, setting up pizza boxes, et cetera. So I've kind of like been doing all the things all these years, but I've always felt like I'm more of a creative developer. And that's what I loved about Flash so much. So part of my talk is a little bit about Flash and the history of web development. And the reason uh, why is because this all relates to what we're doing now and everything is really kind of coming full circle. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So there you go. There's my setup of myself and where I'm coming from. Um, a big source of inspiration for me as a Flash developer has been the FWA. So it was launched in 2000, right at the height of Flash development. And it was the go-to place where everyone would go to check out the latest websites, myself included. It's something I would go there every day as a daily award site. For comparison to the award site with the three Ws, it wasn't until about a decade later, I think it was 2009, that the awards daily award site launched. So there was really only this. This was the main thing, at least for a good decade there, primarily Flash. But the thing that I really love about the FWA as well is it kind of moved on from Flash and became something that's a little bit more diverse. 
So it's not just websites, it's augmented reality, it's virtual reality. And then more recently they've added, you know, NFTs and metaverse stuff. So it's a huge range of things, but the thing I love about it so much is that it's really a celebration of everything digital. It doesn't even need to be websites. And that's the reason why I love the FWA so much. Um, I've got a couple sites on here um, that I wanna share with you guys. Oh yeah, Flash, a lot of Flash influences in the stuff that we're gonna be talking about today. And I've got some fun interactive things that you guys can test out as well. So let's try the first one here. This is from a couple of years ago. It's on the FWA. This is a bit of a multi-user experiment. So if anyone wants to try this as well during the presentation, you can go to multi-user-fluid.glitch.me. If someone in the chat can post that there for other people as well. I'm gonna bring these up. Everyone can play around with these while I'm doing the rest of the talk, if you'd like. <laughs> with this one, you just put in your nickname. And there's this kind of like fluid shader experience. It's a multi-user thing. So if we can get some other people in here, that's not just me, so they can test this out. And I'll talk about this a little bit. This is all open source, by the way. So the source code is all on Glitch. The server side bit of it is based on Mr. Dube's multi-user sketch pad, which was originally released in 2010. So it's 12 years old now. Uh, and then the shader bit, I didn't write this fluid shader from scratch. I've adapted one from Shader Toy, but I did add the functionality to make it like multi-touch. So like multiple, multiple people can be in here at the same time. You can also like long press to make a little radio rainbow. And um, the URL is, thank you, Marty, for sharing that. I'll let you guys play around in this. Hopefully it won't crash. The max, oh, it's already at 20 people, 22, 25. This is the most people that have ever been in here. So we'll see if it crashes or not. You guys can play around with that while I bring up the next one here. So this is the new one from this year. It's also another multi-user experiment. I guess given my kind of like server and hosting background, this is the kind of stuff I really love doing. And for this experiment, I wanted to do the same kind of multi-user experiment, uh, but at the same time, it being 3D, and at the same time, to see if I can do a shared physics engine. So this, the physics engine on it is running server-side, but connecting everyone at the same time. So I'm gonna bring this one up too. It's a similar URL. Again, if someone can post it, or if Marty, you can post it in the channel there. It's multi-user-blocks.glitch.me, same kind of thing. It's an adaptation of the previous job. So we'll bring this one up. It's also repurposing the same input field here. So instead of a name, it's like a color. So if you know hex codes, you can put in a hex color, short form or long form. This one here, if you ever see someone with like a magenta color, that's usually me. And then you can enter the experience here. You can see there's already a lot of people in here. You can click on things and drag it. It might be a little bit slow at first because when all the blocks, oh yeah, it's slow. You can see right now. When all the blocks are first colliding with everyone, it slows down quite a bit, but then hopefully it should speed up after some of these blocks settle down. Oh, wow, yeah, this is slow. Come on. It could be the number of people connected here at the same time. This is also the most people that have been in here. So one thing, and it may have just crashed. Let's see, I'm gonna refresh it. Oh, error, oh wow, it did this crash. Well, there you go. That's the, that's the thing with doing these live presentations and a thousand people watching this at the same time. Go back to this and check it out later. I think it can restart, but I think we might have just crashed the glitch service there. Um, we'll come back to that one. If it does start back up, because it should restart back up if it crashes, a challenge I'll give you guys is to see if anyone can build the highest tower of blocks. So it's a physics-based engine, and then you can try and build with other people, build as high as you can, and then we'll come back to that one. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about the death of Flash a little bit here. Um, as the story goes, most people have heard that the kind of death of Flash was really kind of started by Steve Jobs. And that's true to a certain extent, 
But me having also lived through that as a Flash developer, my only point of view I wanted to give on this is that it wasn't just Steve Jobs and his open letter to the community about why Flash needs to go away. It was also really a problem of hardware at the time. So you have to imagine the iPhone when it came out, and this is also a kind of related you know, industry change that Rachel was talking about in the first talk from today, is that it didn't just kind of like change the whole way we were designing websites. It also changed everything for the Flash development world. It changed everything for creative developers. And for a lot of Flash developers then, we were building Flash sites for high-end computers, like PCs. They were high-end experiences. They were ex like experiential websites. And there's different kinds of sites. Like, you know, there's, I'm oversimplifying here, but there's banking websites where you have the utility of something. And there's, you know, experience websites where you're there for like an experience. And that's what Flash was really all about is for an experience. And with that came, you know, the hardware of a PC computer. And the iPhone, when it first came out, it had pretty good specs at the time. And I got the iPhone as soon as it came out. I got it jailbroken and I installed Flash because that was a thing at the time. All the Flash developers were figuring out how to do that. And it ran terrible. Like even on the best mobile hardware at the time, it was just a horrible experience. And I really quickly realized that I'm not making any Flash stuff on the iPhone. And all the kind of creative developers, at least that I knew at the time, I'm from Toronto, the kind of whole focus shifted from like, well, I want to be making apps for this, you know, new platform. And then the App Store was released the year after the iPhone. I think that was 2008. And then the whole focus kind of like shifted to creative development or doing native apps because you could do games and native apps on the iPhone. And it just kind of changed the whole perspective, like Rachel was talking about this morning, where like, we were expecting bigger and faster computers and more epic experiences, but then everything kind of went the opposite direction with the iPhone and everyone was focused on smaller screens and like the hardware was nowhere near as good as our desktop, you know, experiences. And so that really changed everything. Uh, and that would be my perspective of Flash is it was actually more of like a hardware issue uh, among many other things. Specifications were a big part of it too. Uh, a last little footnote I wanted to talk about here, which is something I do really miss from the Flash days, is at the time, at the height of Flash in 2005, 98% of all computers connected to the internet or the web had Flash installed and running the most recent version. Like, remember how many of those annoying, like, update Flash pop ups that everyone got? The good side of that is everyone was running the latest version, and no matter what browser that you had, it would always have the latest version or a very recent version of Flash. And like that kind of you know percentage of computers running the latest version was great for development. Like you could build it once and you knew it would work everywhere. And for many years, many web developers, we've been struggling with quality assurance and testing on different browsers, and it was just easier in the Flash days as a result of this. So let's talk about WebGL. Let's fast forward a little bit. But notice like the number of like years that have gone by here. So the iPhone came out in 2007, and then WebGL didn't really become a thing, like the first spec, until 2011. So already a lot of years has passed by. And the first version, too, was pretty basic and also really limited by the hardware at the time. So like the best computers at the time with the first version of WebGL, if your browser even supported it, was pretty rudimentary WebGL experiences, like low poly experiences, nothing fancy like the stuff that you see now. And the support for hardware was pretty bad. And it took a long time also for mobile phones to get fast enough GPUs to do the fancy you know, experiences that we're doing now on our mobile phones. None of that stuff existed then. And so even though WebGL may have come out in 2011, it was many years later until we finally got all the support and features that Flash had for years, like a whole decade before that. The first versions of like HTML5 and like WebGL, there was no like webcam support, no real-time communications protocol, all that stuff Flash had had for a whole decade. And even, fun fact, the RTMP protocol, the open source one that we are using now is an open source version of the one from Flash. And it took many years even just to get good webcam support that was connected with that. So between the iPhone and WebGL and then the kind of like early HTML5 and WebGL experiences, there was like a good 10 years. It felt like a whole decade had gone by this almost like dark ages, I kind of call it, of like experiential web work 
because everything just kind of shifted to mobile user experiences. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm all for mobile user experiences, especially the great ones. But it really felt like for the web, like web browsers, this kind of experiential like web design kind of died for 10 years, at least in my opinion. And then things started getting really interesting. So the early HTML5 and WebGL work that I'm showing here, this is uh, Mr. Dube's multi-user sketchpad, The Wilderness Downtown, Three Dreams of Black, Just a Reflector, if anyone remembers these. And then also note, they're all by Google Creative Lab. And Google Chrome was released in 2008 with the following year, Google Chrome Experiments. And along with Mr. Doob, they, they were really kind of pushing the envelope, like how far they could push the technology in Chrome as one of their you know, selling points of Chrome, that it was kind of bleeding edge and using the latest technology. And they were a huge driver of kind of bringing this technology back to the web that we have now. And it really shows kind of in the work here as well. Um, I should mention too, all these slides will be available after the presentation too, and I've spent the time to link every one of these. So if anyone wants to go through this presentation and click on this stuff, they're all links to the actual projects. Many of these aren't online anymore, so most of these are FWA links. Um, I should also call out here too, Active Theory, which I've been a big fan of for many years, has been there at the very beginning and also collaborating with Google on a lot of these projects. So. Moving on, after about a, what seemed like a good decade of a lack of experiential web work, finally the technology and the mobile devices really caught up. And so much so that for me, I feel like mid 2010s is when really the combination of HTML5 and WebGL work was surpassing even the best experiences in the flash days, like really great work. And everything since then has been fantastic. And I really, for me, I really felt like that reinvigorated me from like the work that I was doing in the flash days. And like, to be a little bit honest, I was kind of getting a little bit depressed during those like 10 year periods where I wasn't really doing the creative work that I wanted to. And then this really kind of, you know, breathed new life into it for me and made me really happy to kind of get back into WebGL work. And that's my personal reason why in recent years I've gotten back into WebGL is because I feel like it's reignited that fire that I had from the flash days and we're creating even better experiences now than we were then. So I'm not gonna go through all of these. They're in the slide if anyone wants to check them out. It's just a selection of some of my favorites in the mid 2010s to the near 2018. This Out the Goat one is incredible and also a 3GS project. Okay, so I'm gonna change subjects for a little bit and then we're gonna do like a live coding thing. So bear with me here, these live coding things, just like my project's crashing, you never know. Uh, so this is a bit of a tie-in to Wes's talk after mine too about TypeScript and you know the evolution of these programming languages. So being a Flash developer, an old Flash developer who worked a lot with ActionScript 3, has anyone else noticed the similarity between TypeScript and ActionScript, they're nearly like the same language. ActionScript is an ECMAScript based language. It had full like class syntax, private and public variables. It was strictly typed or strongly typed if you wanna call it that. So what that means is like, you couldn't even compile your application unless you had all the typings properly. So that's interesting. And the reason why I bring that up is there's a lot of talk right now since the beginning of this year, uh, Microsoft has proposed introducing the type syntax from TypeScript into JavaScript. And it seems like there's a lot of division on this. I don't know if Wes is gonna talk about this, but this is definitely a, a big topic that I would like to talk about more if I had more time. And it seems to be really divided, especially with creative developers like myself or generative artists that are working in JavaScript. And the whole thing with JavaScript is it was created for speed and ease of use. Like it was meant to be fast and not have to worry about typing everything out with all these different types. Cause that's, you know, more code, more things that you have to think about. And it kind of like kills your creative like flow if you're a creative developer or an artist. So that's the kind of like one side of the story, but on the other side of the story, even though I do agree with that, is I'm used to or was used to working in ActionScript and like you'd have to properly type everything out with all the types for everything. It was strongly typed. And ActionScript was made for making video games and very creative work and creating all kinds of crazy art. And there's many generative artists that started in Flash and if you're working in ActionScript 3, it's a lot like working in TypeScript. So that's another side of the argument. 
So I, that's, I've talked enough about TypeScript, but I at least wanted to bring that up as like an interesting topic. And it does relate a little bit um, to my framework, if you will, that I'm working on, because I haven't added TypeScript to it. I don't have any plans to currently, unless it becomes part of JavaScript. So, and I'll explain a little bit more of the reason why for that. So this framework that I've created, I consider more as a design pattern. And, you know, having gone through all these, you know, web development trends over all these years, I've been more the kind of person that doesn't like excess tooling. And this is kind of on subject to the previous talk too, where I prefer just to work with what the W3C created. So just like HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, like the old school way that you would build websites. And many of these fantastic websites that I was just showing, especially in the early days, they're all created without all the fancy frameworks and tooling that we have now. They were created the old fashioned way. And they're still amazing experiences. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't have anything against the new like frameworks and tooling, they're fantastic. And they're definitely speedy once you get them set up. But for me, and the focus with this framework, if you will, is I'm trying to use as little tooling as possible. So there is no tooling other than a bundler. And in this case, I'm using Rollup. I've been using Rollup for this thing. And a question for the W3C2 is if you could provide a spec to bundle stuff for you, I know HTTP2 is supposed to do that, but it hasn't been the dream that everyone's wanted to, then we wouldn't need bundlers at all. So that's a challenge that I would give with the W3C is if you can do some spec to bundle things for web browsers automatically, so you don't need to use tooling or frameworks and just write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, that would be amazing. So I, dig I digress here. Let me get back to um, the last little bit of my presentation and then I'll do the live coding bit with a little bit of time that I got left. So back in the day, the way that we would do modules like you would do in ActionScript with JavaScript is this kind of revealing module pattern. The problem with JavaScript is that even this newer version that was released in 2009, ECMAScript 5, it lacked all like the object-oriented programming stuff, like classes, private variables, public variables. And so we would have to make do with all these hacks to kind of do the stuff that we were doing in ActionScript. And this kind of revealing model, uh, module pattern is still very actively used, including in 3.js. The 3.js core, the WebGL core, is still using this pattern. They haven't even moved to using the class syntax yet, just because it worked great. So a quick explanation here is that it's really just a function. And inside the function, you can have more functions. But the scope of everything inside the function is private by default. Like it hasn't been exposed yet. You can return an object with properties to make it public because you're returning the properties. Or you can assign a property to this function, exposing it as well. So that's the revealing module pattern. It's private by default, and then you're just revealing what you want to reveal to the outside you know, code that's using it. So the other side of modules here, too, is the event system. Like Flash and ActionScript had a whole fantastic event-based system. JavaScript was more web-oriented and more oriented around the DOM and elements. And so you didn't have like the same kind of really great event-based system that you could use for making games or experiences. And we've always had to work with these kind of like hacky ways of like doing the same thing. And so the JavaScript spec, this, and remember we're talking about ECMAScript 5 here, has this built-in handle event property. So you can pass in any object and if it has a property called handle event, it'll pass all the events to that and it has the scope of your class automatically. This is great. This is how you would wanna write your code if you're writing a class that's reusable because you want your code when events are fired to be able to access other methods, uh, methods and functions that are in your class. So this works, but it's kind of awkward from a developer experience because you have to you know, stuff all your events in one single handler. And I mean, you can create more functions and then call them from here and that's what people would do. Uh, and then fast forward to you know, another way of doing this. And I'm sure you've seen this kind of like pattern if you're a JavaScript developer for many years is you would use this kind of binding hack to get the this context from your class. So here I've got like an on click expression, which by default in JavaScript, the this context would be of the element, not of your class, which is really annoying when you're a developer that's used to working in classes and you want to access everything in your class. It's not available if it has the scope of the element, you want it to have the scope of your class. So we have to use these kind of binding hacks where you bind the context of your class to every single listener. 
pretty annoying. And then with ECMAScript 6, uh, they added this class syntax as well as methods, but they didn't fix this kind of binding problem. You still have to bind your events, your event listeners or handlers, I should say, with the class itself so it has the correct scope. Now, I think they kind of addressed this a little bit with the arrow functions, but this doesn't fully fix it. So for example, with the arrow functions, they don't have a this context. So when you're calling an arrow function with a listener, it automatically inherits the this context from the class. So you don't need to do a binding hack, which is great, but at the same time too, this is an expression. For those of you that are familiar with JavaScript, expressions you have to declare before you use it. So you have to kind of stuff all your like arrow you know, functions above your listeners in this way. And this is another common pattern I'm sure some of you have seen. So fast forward now to the kind of near the end of my talk about, you know, these classes and these structures here. These are kind of like design patterns that you would use for creating a reusable module and how to access events. With ECMAScript 2022, this is now like official since this year, but browsers have already had support for this and experimental feature for many years. So this would be class properties or class fields, which is part of ES 2022. But now you don't need to use Babel or any kind of transpiler to use these kind of features. This has been available in every browser for over a year now without needing to do Babel or transpiling or anything. And you can use like, uh, these are essentially variables here. So you can see that I've got an arrow function. So it has the this context of its parent, the class, but I have it underneath my listener because you can have like the class properties, you know, defined anywhere outside of the constructor. And for me, this is a lot cleaner of a structure, which is a little bit closer to how I would work in the flash days and definitely an improvement over these hacks that we've had to use in the past. So fast forward to my live coding bit. Let's see if we can do this quickly. Um, Alien.js isn't so much a framework. I mean, it is because it's like a structure that you would put your code in, but it's more of this ES2022 you know, event pattern where you have like your event handlers as class properties and they're organized in that way. And all the classes are built around this structure. So um, the live coding bit I'm gonna do just after I set this up with the structure of this thing is to show a tweet that was from Paul Henschel. He's the lead developer from Rack 3 Fiber and Dre, and we kind of follow each other's work. I was doing like this kind of wobble class that was used on a camera to do like a camera shake or camera wobble. And so he's saying here, great example. It's a nice little effect that really helps with immersion. By the way, Alien looks very interesting. I gave a talk once and was convinced that structuring classes like that is the only way to have a reusable surface in vanilla. And what he's talking about here is this, and I know this is like, this seems like really complicated or crazy, but this kind of like pattern has been around for ages. This is the old fashioned model view controller design pattern. And this is all I've done here with regular JavaScript. So the framework is really just an MVC design pattern and it's all written in native JavaScript. No other tooling, this is just running natively in your browser. So the preloader here uses a dynamic import to load the app. The app creates a render loop and calls every one of the controllers and managers, passing everything kind of like down the tree. The world controller manages the 3JS scene. The camera controller manages the camera. The scene controller, of course, manages all the, like the scene elements, and you can create multiple scene controllers for different scenes. The input manager is for managing things that you can click on on the screen, so like objects that you can click on. And then the render manager is the fanciest thing, at least in my framework. It's a little bit different than the normal 3GS workflow where you'd use like an effect composer. With this one, you're working with the render targets directly. And so it gives you this kind of like more advanced pipeline where you can control every little bit of your render pipeline. And it's a little bit like lower level than using the effect composer. I feel like the effect composer has been abstracted a little too much. And for understanding shaders and how all this stuff works, I find this is a really great learning resource too for understanding how render targets work and how shaders work. So if anything, that's a, a, great, a great resource just for learning. Even if you don't use this for your own projects, I think that's the thing that I really love about this is I've created this as a bit of a learning process for myself. And I think it's been valuable too for other people learning 3JS and how all this stuff works underneath the hood. Um, the rest of this here is really the same kind of workflow that you'd have if you were working with React 3 Fiber or other frameworks that work th with 3.js. You just have groups 
3GS groups. All of your uh, views are inside your groups and you can group them as many times as you like. So let's do the live coding thing. I know I'm like right at like the 30 minutes. Bear with me here because it is very quick and then we'll be done. Okay, so I'm gonna make this really big so you guys can see. And I'm just gonna make this pot like this ES2022 module pattern that I'm talking about. The whole framework is based on this pattern and it's the exact same way that I built it. So I'm gonna make a directory called app. And then here I'm gonna use just NPM. You can use whatever your package manager choice is. Um, let's do init-y create a new package, and we'll install one package. So a development package called serves. Need the I. This is the same local HTTP server that 3GS uses for local development. You can use any local HTTP server. Uh, let's open up now Visual Studio Code. My big complaint with Visual Studio Code, because I've been using it, you know, since it came out, and I've used all the other popular editors over all the years too, is it, it is just so slow. Did you see how long it took just to finish the command line, just to open this thing? Other native editors over the years that are like lower level and not actually running like Chromium are so much faster. Okay. Keeping an eye on time here. So what I'm gonna do, with this default package.json is I'm gonna make it private. So it won't get published. We're gonna have one script for dev and we're just gonna run serves and nice autocomplete there and a public folder. So let's create a public folder. And we don't need the keywords, author, or license, and it is one dependency, the HTTP server. Okay, now we're gonna need a index.html. Let's test this thing just to see if it works. We're gonna do npm run dev. And then we've got it running on localhost. And we need a window for this. Let's use Chrome here. Okay, no errors, great. So next thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna copy paste uh, some boilerplate code here. I'm just gonna grab the one from my own framework, super quick. Copy, paste. We're gonna remove the metadata really quick. An interesting thing here about module support in browsers is that the module scripts, they're deferred by default, so you don't even need to put them in the body. You could be in the head. We'll just do like a main.js really quick. Type equals module. Now we need a main.js just in the current folder. Almost done here. I'm just gonna reload just to make sure that nothing's breaking, no errors. And then now we're just gonna copy paste in the 3JS example. So we're almost done. I'm gonna go to their GitHub page and we're just gonna copy the example right off their GitHub page, right out of the readme. Now this is primarily meant for a build system. So you'd be importing from three. Now, there's also, with the module support of browsers, there's a couple different ways that you can do this without needing any build system at all. So even though I'm using NPM as a package manager here, you don't need to use a build system if your browser supports modules, and every browser does for the past year. So there's been this trend recently to go to a no build kind of setup where you're importing the module this way. They recommend unpackage here. Uh, for example, I'll just show you guys really quick. If we do the unpackage and look under build, these are all the builds that are available, including the module version. 
But an even better version, if you go to CDNJS3, do it really quick here, they have a fourth version, they have a minified version of the module. So this loads super quick because it's the minified version, but you also get the module and all the module functionality that you would get with it. So let's copy that, put it in here. Reload, and we've got our spinning cube, just like that. Almost done. The last little bit of like, who's cleaning here we'll do, we need some styles for this thing. We'll do like a style body by default. Body has a margin, let's make it zero. Okay, we've got our spinning cube. So the last little bit of my live coding thing that I wanted to show you here is really just this pattern. And one way for new developers that are working with 3JS, if you did want to use this pattern, is a lot of the code examples on 3JS that you'll find are all very linear like this. They're not structured in a class that's reusable, kind of like Paul's talking about. But many of them have like comments, indicators like init and animation. And so this is how you can structure your code, your, or your classes. Many of them are already organized in a way that you would create a class for this. So let's create a class. We'll do a class, we'll call it like app. And there's a couple different ways that you can create an app uh, or instant instantiate it. You can do like a new app like that. So you're creating an instance of it. You can do a static class. So a static class, you would do like app.init. I prefer doing that for like top level controllers and then using instances for things that you would create and destroy kind of thing. So we're gonna do a static class. Static class doesn't need a constructor. You could do like static init. So think of this as like your constructor and then anything you have an init will run. So let's try our init here. I'm just taking the section from init, putting it in here. In fact, let's put this whole thing in here for now. And then let's see if this runs. Okay, still runs, haven't broken it. Next thing, this animation could be an event handler. In fact, it is an event handler with the animation loop. So let's move that into this ES22-2022 class variable. It needs to be static. If you're working with a static class, all the properties that you're calling or variables will need to have the same static in front of it so you can access it from the static instance of it. We'll keep animation, but just like I was talking about with these arrow functions, it needs to be an arrow function. And then now this will have the this context of the class. So we don't need to do any binding hacks here. And the very last bit, and then I'm done. So close. This is the annoying thing about working with classes that people, uh, for people that do want to work in this kind of like older class-based structure, need this dot in front of everything because we're referencing this. Hopefully we get everything here. Geometry, material, scene, mesh, render, animation. We're calling this dot animation handler. Render, and then you got to do it here to this, this, render to this, this, this. So this is basically in front of everything. Okay, let's save this, fingers crossed. It still works, great. So the last little thing I'll say here, this is the very beginning of the structure, is then you just keep adding more and more to this design pattern. You've got this kind of like clean way now of organizing your, your initialization, your constructor, your event handlers, and then you just keep adding classes in this way. It would be, we wouldn't use static if it was a, a regular class that you're instantiating. So like, for example, you could do like add listeners for one to add like all the listeners. And then you put like all your listeners in there. And then like, if this was like a class, something that you're gonna create and then destroy, I mean, I wouldn't use a static class for this. So this may be a bad example, but like, you do like your destroy arrow function. And then you'd remove the listeners in there. So you do like a add listeners, remove listeners kind of thing. Oops. I don't know if anyone caught this mistake. I made a mistake here. 
grab the wrong thing. Copy. There, that's what we want. And then you can remove it here if you wanted to remove it. And then this one would be like this dot remove listeners kind of thing. You get the idea. So you just keep adding and adding to this, reusing the same pattern. And then the add listeners too, of course, you'd need to put in here. I'll run this one more time and then I'm done. Do add listeners. Add listeners. Just make sure this still works. Yeah, okay, it's still working. So to see the rest of this kind of flow of these different things, uh, I'm going to go back to my presentation now. We'll exit out of here. And you can kind of see like incrementally how I've added to this pattern. It all just started with this, starting with the 3JS example. And close this all down now. Um, the supporting service code for this, as well as all the other versions of how it's kind of been blown out into the current framework the way it is right now, it starts with this three example and then adding the 3JS effect composer and then doing a version without the effect composer. So like writing your own, which is like the render manager way that I do or the way that I use it. Working with raw shader materials for people that want to work with shader toy and other more advanced techniques. And then my own tween animation engine, but you don't need to use any of that. It's more like a learning resource. Um, if you want to check out the rest of this on how it was kind of built into the design pattern that it is now, it's all been put here at Creative Coding uh, TO 2022. And like I mentioned, this was an adaptation of a presentation that I did a couple months ago with Refre uh, Reflector Digital. So I wanted to give like a big shout out to Reflector Digital for allowing me to do the presentation. It was thanks to you guys. Also, that full two-hour version of this presentation is also available uh, through Reflector Digital. If you want to check out my landing page, I've got a link to it that's there at ufo.ai. Uh, and then the very last bit, I know there's going to be no time left for questions, but I feel like this is important to talk about. The, these dry, wet kiss principles are really important as a developer and as one of my kind of main takeaways that I would have as like an old developer all these years and having lived through all these different ways of doing things. Uh, for those of you that don't know these principles, it's the don't repeat yourself, the write everything twice, and the keep it simple, stupid. And every one of those does matter and they may seem like they conflict with each other, but that's the point. I kind of feel like it's a balance with these things. And if there's anything to take away from this presentation, I think that the history of web development has given us a wide range of technologies and design patterns, and that as humans, we tend to overcomplicate things. Sometimes the simplest approach is the best, easiest to manage, and most importantly, easier to have fun when it doesn't feel like a chore. And that's why I think it's super important that we keep an eye on the tooling that we've got with all these projects, because sometimes it feels like it's really just getting out of hand. And if there's a way that we can do it in a simpler way, working just with the core technologies of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, I think that's the simplest, easier way. But don't get me wrong, I use all the big frameworks, React, Angular, Vue, they're all moved to TypeScript as well, and I think that's the direction that everything is going. So tooling is good, so long as it's not a chore. That's the key. Uh, and there you go. I guess that's my talk. I've totally used up the 45 minutes, I apologize. That's uh, that is okay, Patrick. It was really uh, you. Have, you have to know that we we're all giving you uh, huge props for attempting the live coding during uh, during a presentation. Um, I think. Oh, it's uh, difficult. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I know. <laughs> um, so I, you know, one thing that uh, I'm curious about, and and maybe like we'll, we'll steal a minute or so from the break for that. Um, where do you see? Alien.js going? Like, what, what's your vision for that? That is a good question because, you know, kind of like I started this presentation, I didn't want it to be just like another JavaScript framework. And maybe, or hopefully, that's what you guys see from this presentation is it's not just another JavaScript framework. For me, it's been a learning resource. So that's kind of like how I've been learning to get into WebGL and 3JS work. It's a different way of doing things. And for me, it's a learning resource, but not just for myself, for other people. 
So if other people wanted to use it on their own projects, that's amazing. There are at least a couple that I've seen in the wild, but mostly I've seen other people using it as a learning resource for shaders and learning render targets. So more advanced topics with 3JS. And even if it's just that, I think that's fantastic as a learning resource. So that's what I'm gonna continue doing with it is uh, I don't have any documentation really for it yet. I'm gonna add some documentation to it, document mm -hmm. all these design patterns. And then if people can learn from it, and apply it in their own projects, and that's great. That's great. Um, you know, I think it's sort of a recurring theme uh, today around um, creativity, problem solving, um, using the things to get the mundane out of the way so we can actually have more fun, be more creative. Um, I keep using that word, but, I, you know, I, I think uh, can can do things beyond those basics that that we can get from um, from knowing knowing the things that we're working with better. Um, last question, do you think that uh, we're getting to the point where those basic core things of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript with the capabilities that they have are going to get us back to that ease of use that Flash brought? And that's, you know, with a heavy asterisk about ease of use, but but it did let us do a lot of cool stuff. That's what I miss most about it. It was just easy back then. Whether you use the timeline or you're a coder working in ActionScript, I didn't mind all the typings back then either because it was just fun and there wasn't the chore of doing development. And there was a lot less tooling because there was just the one tool. So as I, I yearn for those easier days and I think we can get back there at some point. Cool. Well, I know that um... With the things that we've been seeing today about uh, new things in in CSS, uh, things that you're showing us in in plain old like good old vanilla JavaScript, uh, those things are all um, really super important in allowing us to be more expressive and do more interesting things on the web. Can't thank you enough for taking the time to share this with us.